We're back on Play It Forward with Mary Lou Belli, writer, director, filmmaker. Thank you for being on the show, Mary Lou. Hi. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I'm pleased to be here. I'm pleased to have you back. Um, we were just talking about cinematography, and we're going to talk a little bit about production. And we might as well start in with this book that you just mentioned with me that oh. you are so enthused about, um, Cinematography, Theory, and Practice. Yeah, by Blaine Brown. Never met him. I probably sell more books for him than probably any other single person than himself. <laughs> um, but it's um, when I'm t uh, recommending it to directors, I always say, you know, about 60% of what's in this book, you don't need to know as a director. But the other 40%, just brilliant. And he explains things so well. Um, there's one uh, little piece of uh, when he talks about um, con continuity of motion. And just, you know, you know, there's there's my rule when I teach directing is you have to know the rules before you break them. You can't cross the line unless you know you're crossing the line. And if you want to cross the line for a reason, feel free, especially if it, you know, jolts your audience and you want that kind of reaction. But you got to know the rules. You got you have to be aware of of the agreement between the audience viewer and the film as a filmmaker about what what's the language of film that has been set up, you know, for years and years and years, you know, back when we were doing, you know, talk before talkies, you, yeah. know, there's, well, you know, there's, it's storytelling. It's that's... storytelling that has to make sense, you know, just little things, you know, the fact that we go from a wide shot to a close up and, and how we go from an objective to a subjective point of view. It's, you know, there's, there's so many things, you know, and what that makes an audience feel and using the language of the camera to help um, tell the story. Well, I think that's super sound advice and a great place to start knowing the rules. And, you know, when you talk about the continuity of motion and, and this book in particular, you know, let's frame it, let's get into the details here. So, you know, let's talk about the top, you know, three or four things that are really resonant in the book and, you know, to kind of get us started and you can go anywhere. But when you say continuity of motion, I mean, are we talking about from cut to cut, like from a wand to close cut up to cut. So if and when that exits. cup is going to the mouth, you're, you know, in oh, yeah, mid motion. Yeah. Yeah, but also, but more in, you know, I always say to any director who wants, I said, take your iPhone out. And it's exactly the exercise that I was given um, as a person who was going from a multi-camera, very proscenium-like filming to, you know, this is a 360 degree palette you now have, but something like do a chase. Like you can do it with your kitten. You can do it with a cat. You can do it with, you know vitamin bottles, whatever that is. But if you exit right frame, then you're going to enter left frame. You can change, you know, to a neutral. Are you going to film from the back? Are you going to film to the right? But if that's happening, are they exiting right frame or left frame? Just because you know, there's rules and they make sense, you know, to the people viewing them. And if you don't like just, for instance, that silly thing of, if a plane is going from the East Coast to the West Coast, it always goes left to right. If a plane goes from the West Coast to the East Coast, it goes right to left. I mean, why is that? But that's, we've set these parameters up. Um, simple things like having, you know, two people, if I'm cutting from you to me talking. Now, of course, we're both looking neutrally at each other right now. But if I was going to cut us, you know, I would have one of us looking right and one of us looking left so that when I cut, it would feel as if we were looking at each other, you know, and just setting those things up when you're filming in two different locations, you know, weeks apart, you know, and is the simple things like is the, um, uh, just the, the where our eyes are going, you know, that exact same angle. So we, yeah we're just matching things you know be, and matching do you match size do you not match size do you do does an over shoulder have to play against another over the shoulder just just you know simple things like that which becomes aesthetic and it's also why when I was you know teaching on the um faculty at the U.S. school school of cinematic arts um I would make my class bring in fine art paintings and we would just discuss framing 
you know, we can learn something from, they, they're called old masters for a reason. You know, how did Rembrandt frame a portrait? What happens when we short side somebody as opposed to putting them in the middle or putting them on the other? There's that very, very funny line. Oh, I can't remember what movie it's in now. Oh, I think it's in, I think it's in the Fablemans, in the Fablemans, when the Spielberg-like character gets advice about where to put the horizon. In the middle, not so interesting. Low or high, interesting. You know, just, just, there's yeah. so much to be learned and sure. so much, I mean, and I think it's one of the reasons I love my job so much is because there's rarely a day that I don't come off the set and go, oh, I learned this today. And sometimes it's about, the camera sometimes it's about storytelling but sometimes it's about personal interaction or you know sometimes Absolutely. you come home and go oh I could have done that better <laughs> you know you know because it's psychology too so absolutely so much going on what are the top two things that you go into when you're on set and when you're working with the camera what are the you know things that are um, top of mind well when I'm working with the camera um I, I like to be near the camera if at all possible, unless the camera is going to see me, then I have to hide someplace. Um, so I physically like to be at the camera or near the camera. Um, and I would say my interaction with the actors, and that's why I want to be cl close to them, because I will never yell or rarely, rarely will I give a direction that's not in their ear. And and so funny because that that suggestion came from a remark by I want to say Gary Cooper, Gregory Peck, some some old movie star, but a very very well respected actor, who said, "The moment that a director gives me a note in front of the entire crew, first of all, it's hard enough to be an actor. Oh, for sure. But he said, if someone then tells me what to do in front of a a whole mass of people, you have set up a situation where I'm being judged, not just by the director who's there to help me get to the performance he or she wants, but the entire crew is saying, oh, did he do that? Did he do it softer? Did he do it faster? Did he, what, you know, not that I right. give softer or faster right, kind right, of right. notes, but, you know, was he more empathetic? Was he really seducing her? So I will always try to go up and give notes quietly to an actor. Um, you know, and simple things like, um, I was just working with a icon, icon of an actor who's a little older now. And I realized that, you know, sets are chaotic. And if I brought this actor in amongst the chaos, this actor did not perform as well as if I brought this actor into a very calm setting and i was literally sometime i was ready to roll and the only thing the actor heard was action cut let's go again you know so it's it's those things and then on yeah. set i usually use three tools and and uh, uh, anyone who is taught by me learns these and practices them because they're so readily available because there's no time to work endlessly like I used to do in the theater where you'd sit down, do table work, discuss motivation. <laughs> There's money and time and a time and a clock ticking. Um, so I, I give nearly every direction has to do with the subtext of the line or what's underneath the line, an action verb that discusses the intention and then a scale of one to 10. So I might say, you know, when you said blah, 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 or I usually don't say the line because I never want to be accused of giving a, a line reading, but I'll go, you know, the line that refers to the water bottle. When you say that water bottle line, um, I'm getting that you're coercing, but I really want you to seduce. And then they'll do it and they'll go, yeah, that's great. The seduction was perfect, but the seduction was at a 10, but I need it at an, a seven. Otherwise, it's too transparent. And, and I don't even talk that long. Also, the big mistake and rookie mistake of new directors is that they just talk too much. Yeah. You would be surprised if you are on my set how little I say. 
Yeah, no, I can I can see that. So you said action verb subtext and then um, the scale. Uh, scale. Yeah, great. So, okay. Um, what else before we move on to post? I mean, do you think there's, you know, there's no, some... well, yeah, the most important yeah. thing an act, a director has to do is be the leader on the set. Yeah. So the most, the, the, you know, I, the, again, again, rookie mistake is it, the person who ha says action has to say cut. And then the person who says cut has to announce what's happening next. And even if I don't know exactly what's happening next, my voice is one say, cut, give me a second, or cut, going again, cut, moving on, cut, check the gate, cut, um, you know, uh, turning around, whatever that is. Mm. There's no one else on set that should be moving it along and making the decisions other than the director. You know, the whole the whole motto of my my guild is one director, one vision. Well, that vision, you know, also is not just creative vision, but it's also the practicality of production and knowing that I have to bring something in on time and on budget. And that if we do it this way, which is a pride and proven way, you know, it will, it works. Mm -hmm. so, so you'll do um, the directions of cut in action versus having your AD do it. Uh, okay. I will say sometimes my... AD, I will say, uh, you know, I'll yell out his or her name and say, um, call it. Because sometimes if I'm really close to a cameraman, I don't want to scream in his ear. <laughs> um, although they, you know, I will usually walk into the set and say cut. So I'm not screaming in a, a camera person's ear or boom operator's ear or whatever. Um, but I, um, but most of the time, I'm not a person who likes to ever yell on set. So if it's a huge group and, you know, I know I can have a megaphone or amplification. I just don't like to be that person. So if it's a big crowd thing, you know, um, although that's not always, you know, it's every situation warrants that decision for me. And my mm -hmm. AD knows that it's always me unless I tell the AD it's them. <laughs> Got it. And, and sometimes, you know, it's not just action. It's, it's, you know roll speed then it's um background playback cut out the playback action you know or what's playback those things. if i'm doing some music oh, okay. that i want everybody to be you know moving to in the same rhythm i'll do a little bit of a playback at the top i see um or there might be um uh, there might be a camera move and i'll say you know background camera there's a camera that starts to move and then I say action mm -hmm. or it might be background. It might be a two thing. It might be background. I call a character's name who starts moving first. And then I say action for the person who's about to speak first. Mm -hmm. you know, there's, mm -hmm. there's always, there's complicated ways. I start shots. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Thank you, Mary Lou. Um, shall we move on to post-production? Yeah, please. Okay. So here we are. We've got a bunch of footage. We're getting started. Do you like to have your editor go through it first? Are you there day one? Always. Yeah. No, I'm ne never there day one. Okay. Um, mainly because I do television. And that um, editor often, depending on when it's due or whether it's due fast or not, most people like to start cutting the moment they start getting dailies in. So they're not cutting in order. Um, they're cutting it scene by scene. Um, if it's something complicated, I will send notes in an email or pick up the phone and say, hey, this, just so you know, like I had a scene that ends the second episode of a, a show I'm doing now called Kingdom Business. And I, in terms of the storytelling, and what I discussed with my exec producer, showrunners, show creators, was I wanted to establish some details of the decadence of the room I was in. So, and this is before the main character walks in and says the first line, or a character, a, you know, a tertiary character says something to that person who's entering. Um, so I said, I'm doing these little, you know, I said, here's the pattern I want. Pop, pop, like smaller detail, smaller detail, wide. 
Mm-hmm. Wide is where we will see that character enter. Mm-hmm. But I want to I want to tell the audience some details about where they are first, and I don't want to do it in a big, wide, old master, sure. which is not. So we got be. ashtray, beer bottles, six pack, exactly. Wide shot of the room, exactly. Exactly. Character opens the Let door. me just say that one of one of it, it, it was a very sexy scene, and it starts with a cigar. Mm-hmm. There you go. Hey, Bill. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes, I hope they reference that. <laughs> um, so, um, so it's, you know, there's things like that. Or I might say, um, I, I'll say, take a whack at it. You know, I, I know, I know the, what I'm planning for it. But like, for instance, there's a big, big, big set piece production number in um, the same episode. And um, and I won't tell you what involves, but the editor did not cut to a detail I wanted, and I wanted the audience to know this was about to happen because it actually matched up with the sound so set piece production number what what is that exactly set piece is like if 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 i was doing home alone one of the set piece of the piece would be one of the tricks the little kid does to thwart the okay. guys trying to rob the house whatever okay, okay. um in, in a musical it's the big musical number okay you know whatever that is got it um, so, so big um, action it's 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 the big piece you know yeah if in ncis it was what am I blowing up today? Okay. What am I crashing today? Who's going to die and how they going to, you know, that sort of thing. Got it. You know, it's, you know, it's complication when you're doing action is like, you got to, it's really, you can't film it as one scene because there's, unless you're doing it all VFX, it's the before blood part and the after the blood part. Got it. Yeah. You definitely want both there. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so it's just, you know, different things. Um, and, and so I will always get a cut from them. And then my, um, and then the director's guild guarantees on our episodic, I get four days to cut it. So that first, I get it the night before my first day of cutting and I will watch it through. I often don't even have a pencil in my hand. Then I'll watch it through again and take some notes. And then I, depending on if it's in great shape and I shouldn't tell editors this, but they'll figure it out. Um, I'll start from the beginning. If the beginning piece is complicated and it's not quite there, I'll, I'll never start with anything too challenging with an editor because I want, especially if it's an editor I haven't worked with before, I want a rapport knowing that if I change something, I want you to trust our relationship in terms of the tweaks or sometimes big changes I'm asking you for. So I will um, work on something where we can be successful together. Uh, so sometimes I'll say, hey, let's jump to this scene. You know, I, there's not much I want to do in it, but I just want to tweak. And then they'll get a sense of how I work, you know, because yeah. I usually trim the tail, you know, or add to the head or, you know, uh, let's put an interstitial establishing shot in between this. Um, hey, let's look at the footage from every take of this because I think this isn't the funniest one. This isn't the most poignant one, or she took a pause here. Sometimes I'm cutting and and mm-hmm. sometimes I'll say, just take another shot at this scene. Mm-hmm. We weren't telling the right story. Mm-hmm. And sometimes I'll just let them go back and we'll end our editing session, you know, two hours early so that they can do that privately and be successful because sometimes, you know, there's, you know, so many different stories you can tell from footage, but um those are great 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 tips do you they're great tips it's a, a you know i mean i think in anything the relationship starts first and then to do that in a way that you build it and everything the details of what you said are are great tips and tricks of where to start in developing that relationship and do it casually and then let it progress after some trust has been built you were going to say you you were working on that big set piece you were going to give an example i asked you what it was and then i think maybe oh I got yeah you no off no what, what, well, i can't give the details of it but what happened was there was i i wanted to tell the audience something was happening 
because I because it matched part of my sound montage and it would not have made sense to to first reveal this big part of it without because the sound montage sort of gave it away earlier i said no we have to tell the audience this is happening at the same time we reveal it with the sound so the story had to match mm -hmm. the picture mm -hmm. the sound had to ma match the picture we were telling mm -hmm. and um so you know just little things like that um and then we work through the my editor and i usually work beginning to end we sometimes can get through the whole show at least my first you know pass at it in one day but sometimes you know it's we break it up into two days um and then we go back in and do little things you know i will on a lot of shows the exec producer writer creators will often not want you to cut any lines but i'm not stupid i know it's way too long um so i will say let's build some cuts and then when the editor goes in with the exec producer, they'll go, hey, Mary Lou had some suggestions for this. So they've seen where I would trim. Trim it internally, sometimes trim entire scenes and cut them out. Sometimes uh -huh. rearranging scenes, not uh -huh. in the order that they were in the script. But it's so much easier for a person to make a decision. And I learned this with my first episode I ever directed of Monk. Um, but it's easier to make a decision when you can see it. And the person can say, this is what we have. This is what's in Mary Lou's cut. But here's the alternative she wants you to look at. They press play and the person can go, oh, yeah, I like that. Or, oh, yeah, I don't miss that line at all. But it's not saying she wants to cut out this line. They get to see it without the line. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and it's always the best way to try to sell something. And I learned this. Um, I was in an edit bay for an episode of Monk. And listen, I had come from sitcoms. Everything was about precise comic timing. And we watched it. There were five people in the room. There were Twitter, you know, little, you know, everybody laughed a little, but I knew it was a big laugh, but I knew what was wrong was the timing between the setup and the punchline was off. And I said to the editor, uh, take, you know, two frames off of the this and a second off, off of the tail and another whole second off of the head. So that, because you have to understand this, and I learned this from James Burroughs, um, a lot of time of, of, of comedy is just comic timing and it's music to me. So if, if it's a four measure, you know, if it's bum, 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 but it's bum, 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 pause, bump, not funny, you know? So the, so I will, and the, and then the editor did this and, and, and I got some, you know, I was a newbie director in terms of hours. I had, I've done over a hundred episodes of sitcoms, but they said, well, you know, it was like, and I said, just do it. You know, I, I made a joke about, it. I said, I said, if I'm wrong, God, I'll be embarrassed, but just watch it. Every single person in the room laughed out loud once I had fixed it. And I instantly earned some real cred. Mary Lou <laughs> Belli. Questioned that sort of, you know, we'll listen. Timing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I love the conviction. Mary Lou Belli, thank you for the experience that you've shared with us. You shared such a, a great deal of it in the short time that we've had. Thank you for being back on the show. I wish you all of the best, continued health, relaxation um, in your home, enjoying it. And, um, you know, let us know what you're doing and we will share it with our audience. Great. Next couple things coming up is, uh, next thing is uh, episodes nine and 11 of, or nine and 12 of True Lies on CBS. Okay, cool. All right, Mary Lou Bell, I always a pleasure. Filmmaker, writer, director. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.